for those who can't make it. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Cheryl Gravy and if you haven't had a chance yet to uh, tell us in the chat where you're from and to type in a little few words or sentence about what you or your league might yeah. be doing uh, to combat disinformation, we'd appreciate that. Um, so for today's session, um, we're so glad to have Peter Adams. We will cover in this session, Peter will uh, have a presentation with us for about 45 minutes. We'll have an opportunity to have questions uh, and answers for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to break you into small groups to have a discussion about building trust uh, during this election cycle. And then we'll invite you back into the big room to share some of those ideas that came out of your conversations. Um, okay. With that, I would also like to have you just take a quick poll. Uh, what do you think the impact of disinformation on the elections will be? Um, do you think it'll be none or minimal or moderate? So you got my attention. We're putting a little fun in the language here. Uh, I think it'll have a significant impact. Your heart's racing on that impact. Or maybe it'll be extreme impact. Our hair, our democracy is on fire. So thank you for taking just a minute here and answering just a few seconds to answer your response in the poll. Very good. I will close it now and we'll share the results. So as you can see, this group is uh, mostly leaning on, you know, concern with significant impact, uh, about 68% of you and about 21% think extreme impact and 11% think moderate impact. So, uh, yeah, with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to my colleague and partner in this, uh, Barb Lyman's Barb. And unmute yourself, Mark. Unmute. Yeah. There you go. Hi. Um, I think basically we're hoping this afternoon that Peter is going to stop our hearts from racing and give us some effective tools to help us in this upcoming election cycle. And with that, I'm honored to welcome Peter Adams, who is the News Literacy Project's Senior Vice President of Education. He currently oversees the News Literacy Project's education team which develops resources and training materials. We're also honored that Peter is a friend of the league and frequently presents at local meetings and um, has recently presented at the Illinois State um, Issues and Advocacy Meeting. So with that, I know you're gonna find his expertise in news literacy informative and enlightening as we all attempt to understand and counteract the current mis disinformation that threatens trust in our democracy. Peter, I'll turn the program over to you. Thanks so much, Barb, and thank you all for uh, inviting me here today. Um, I appreciate that, and um, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm going to share my screen here and share my slides. Does that look good to everybody? Excellent. Great. I lose my view of you all when I do this, so I just uh, want to make sure that everything looks good. So. Uh, as Barb mentioned, I'm Peter Adams. I head the education team uh, at the News Literacy Project, which is a nonpartisan national education nonprofit um, that serves both educators and uh, the public um, to help them become more informed and engaged participants in democracy and to really give them a fighting chance in today's information environment, which, which is, uh, I think, as we all know, the most complex uh, and also the largest in human history and is moving so quickly that um, Everybody needs uh, that kind of help, I think, to, to, to stay abreast of, of changes. You can learn more about NLP at our website at newslit.org. Uh, if you look in the chat, I left a link to a PDF copy of my slides. If you download that, um, the images, a lot of the images in, in, in the deck are hyperlinked. So you can click on the image and jump to our website, for example. So um, do check out that link uh, in the chat. Um, uh, uh, for the PDF copy of the of the deck, the the videos and things won't ride along in the PDF, but you'll have the the images. Um, I also author our viral rumor rundown blog, uh, which lives at rumors.newslit.org, and this is a recap of some recent viral rumors, which you'll see examples of of me covering um, in the in the in the presentation today. 
Um, but we, you know, restate sort of what is true and isn't true, but then explain uh, what you can take away from that. And that's part of what I'll be doing today. So if you enjoyed today's presentation, uh, I will um, uh, uh, suggest that you, you check out the Bauer Rumor Rundown blog and possibly subscribe to our newsletter, uh, Get Smart About News, which has a recap of viral misinformation and also kind of the news literacy takeaway, what you can learn from this. Uh, I strongly believe um, that, that being news literate um, is a civic duty. So I kind of want to offer that up as a frame at the top of today's talk. Uh, and I kind of have three reasons why. First is that I think as we all know in the room, information is the, is the foundation and the basis for civic literacy, for civic agency and for civic action, right? So um, our decisions, our information is the basis for our, our beliefs and decisions and positions on issues. And those are the basis for our votes and, and, uh, and other actions, other civic actions. Um, and as I mentioned, the public is grappling with, with the largest and most complex information environment in human history. And then finally, you know, the future of democracy really depends on our collective ability to distinguish credible information from misinformation and to reestablish a center, a kind of shared uh, set of facts. And I think, um, you know, the recent escalation in political polarization and the fragmenting of the information landscape uh, threatens that. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we really see information as the basis for decisions and the decisions as the basis for our actions. Um, and the way I think about misinformation um, is kind of seeking to, to hijack that trajectory at the beginning, to, to redirect um, our decision making and our thinking and our actions and what we think we know. Um, and so to, to, to sort of redirect that, that uh, process in a direction that's less civically authentic, um, less in the interests of ourselves, our families, our communities, uh, our country. And the way that exploit works, um, and I do view misinformation as, as fundamentally exploitative um, because it seeks to, to target our most deeply held beliefs and values, our patriotism, our religious faith, our belief in equity and justice and fairness, um, and uses that against us, right? And, and seeks to, to um, uh, provoke a strong emotional reaction uh, and also to tap into to our innate vulnerabilities, our cognitive biases, our desire to confirm the things we already believe, for example, uh, we're very vulnerable to that. Um, and to pass uh, non-evidence off as evidence um, to, 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 to accomplish that. Um, it also seeks to enlist us as amplifiers, right? So uh, that's an important piece here as well. As I mentioned earlier, polarization, uh, political polarization in the US has been increasing. Uh, the Pew Research Center has tracked this since the late 90s. And you can watch where the median Republican and median Democrat uh, views are um, on various issues. Um, and in different cycles, at different points, they slide right and left. Um, we're, I'm waiting for Pew to update this. The last time they sort of produced this particular uh, finding was 2017. Uh, but it's only increased since then. So here are some findings from 2017 that are driven by um, issues, uh, gun policy, um, uh, attitudes about uh, race and racism in the United States, um, climate and the environment, immigration, and so on. Um, and you can see in 2020, when Trump voters and Biden voters were polled, they were incredibly far apart on some big issues. Uh, for example, the question of whether or not it's a lot more difficult to be a black person in the United States than it is to be a white person, you can see the gap is, is huge. Um, uh, also, the, the question of whether newcomers in American society strengthen that society or not, uh, questions about Islam, questions about gender, um, and questions about uh, gun rights and gun control um, as well. So um, there's a popular concept in, in media studies and media literacy called the Overton window, which, which has to do with sort of the parameters of acceptable discourse at any given time. Uh, and that uh, on either side, left and right, there are, uh, there's a kind of theoretical center, which, <clears throat> which I think is in flux and very hard to target. And then there are things on the, that lean left and lean right that are popular policy ideas. Uh, and then a little further out, left and right, sensible. And then outside of that parameter of acceptable discourse are things that uh, are maybe radical or unthinkable. Um, and political actors, so goes the theory, 
try to sort of shift that Overton window left and right. So people on the far left try to pull it left and get ideas that are just outside of acceptable discourse to be more acceptable, sometimes by injecting more extreme ideas into discourse to pull the center and people on the right are engaged in the same thing. So this is not at all fixed, right? What counts as the, as the center uh, in, in public discourse is in flux and what counts as a liberal idea or a conservative idea, I would argue, is in flux over time, right? If you track these things uh, across uh, decades. Um, and I would say the same thing goes for public perception of news and media coverage, right? So people love to talk about news sources that lean left or lean right, um, but this is very hard to, to pin down. You know, what, what counts as the center and who decides and what makes a particular piece of news coverage or a particular news source left leaning or right leaning um, uh, can be tough to, to answer. Um, there are some obvious examples, obviously, things that have overt or inarguable bias, but in terms of mainstream coverage, um, I think it's, it's, it's far tougher. Um, and, you know, public perception of, again, of what counts as a, a, a liberal idea or a liberal um, uh, piece of commentary is also in flux. It swings to the right, and what used to be the center is now considered the left. Uh, it also swings, sorry about that, it also swings back to the left. Uh, and what is what was once considered, you know, the, a far right idea uh, is outside the parameter and what used to be considered moderate or left leaning is now more conservative. So um, that shifts over time. And I think what we're starting to see now with this fragmenting um, is our information landscape possibly pulling apart, right? So that discourse is no longer shifting together, but actually just pulling to pulling to the poles and we're watching the center kind of evaporate. Um, so that's that's a, just a kind of theoretical frame as we um, head into the rest of the, the rest of the talk here. Um, and I'll start with election disinformation, which is great that so many of you are engaged with election work, obviously. And um, as I know, so many so many folks in in uh, chapters are, uh, but also specifically here to think and talk about election mis and disinformation. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll I'll start with that. Um, we know, obviously, in 2016 that uh, that Russian disinformation agents played a significant role in really dividing Americans, appealing to the polls, the the not not the not the uh, voting polls, but the polar extremes of of each party or each ideology. So they they tried to aim for people on the on the far left to 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 get them to double down on their positions, and the same on the far right, and really exacerbate that trend we saw in the Pew uh, graphic, um, just, to, just to drive Americans even further apart than they already were. In 2020, though, um, the findings were that, that we largely did this to ourselves. The vast majority of disinformation uh, in the election um, uh, was, was domestic in origin, and, and the Russians and others uh, played far less of a role uh, in 2020. Um, but looking back at 2020, um, there are some important trends that I think are important are going to be important again in the, in the midterms and again in 2024. And so it's worth a look back. And also I would argue it's not all behind us because these things are coming back. I'm starting to see some of these rumors get reposted as a way to um, sort of lay the groundwork for mis and disinformation in, uh, in, in, 2020, in, the, in 2022 during the midterms later this fall. So um, this was a popular rumor that somebody got two ballots uh, got a lot of traction in 2020, uh, but in fact, they were sample ballots uh, from Allegheny County. So this person said that uh, they were in California, um, and then this wasn't true. Neither was true. These were sample ballots uh, sent to them. Uh, and, and even if two ballots were somehow mailed to them, of course, only one would count, as, as you both know, as you all know. Um, the uh, Another key, key phrase here is a rumor queue, you know, a post that asks you to make it go viral. Uh, to ask you to amplify is always a red flag and it's important to keep in mind. Here's another one, um, you know, very reliable, good friend of mine who just finished poll worker training uh, and um, pushes the idea that uh, if anybody writes anything on your ballot before they give it to you or put it in the voting machine to be tabulated, um, it could be disqualified if it's written on, you know, look out for this. This is actually uh, uh, entirely false. There are actually states and districts where poll workers are required to write on ballots uh, before they um, feed them into machines or before they hand them to you. So imagine the, the confusion at the polls 
for people who believe that their votes are being invalidated based on an anonymous post online providing no other evidence than an anecdote from a very reliable good friend of a person who is you don't know online. Um, you can also find this same text posted by dozens of people across uh, social media. Um, this kind of copy paste rumor is is called copy pasta uh, in internet parlance uh, and presents a real threat. We also saw a lot of things like this. Here's a video of someone taking what appear to be ballots, but again, it's very easy to print sample ballots at home. Um, they're wearing gloves. They're saying things like, you know, I hate Trump. Got to do what you got to do. I'm going to take these 80 Trump ballots that I stole as an election worker. Again, no evidence that this person is an election worker. Uh, they are just burning paper with what appear to be, uh, you know, ballots or sample ballots printed on them and burning them in an undisclosed location. We know nothing else. Eric Trump shared this, and you can see the kind of engagement that got. Um, and, you know, it feeds into a narrative. Uh, but you can see their digital forensics folks actually paused it and zoomed up on some of the some of the uh, the paper at the beginning and found that they were actually sample ballots um, that you can see. Rumors like this as well with folks writing on ballots. This is kind of how that copy pasta rumor comes back around. Uh, you know, there were live feeds of a lot of elections in 2020, and there were a lot of folks watching those, and they thought what they were seeing maybe because they'd seen the claim on social media, were poll workers cheating, um, putting votes under, you know, in, in bins and sliding them under tables or pulling them out from under tables or writing on them, uh, or in this case, uh, a worker transposing a damaged ballot um, uh, from a voter. So, it, you know, the, the claim was in this case that an election worker is filling out a blank ballot uh, to, to uh, swing the election or to cheat, uh, when in fact there was a damaged ballot that needed to be transposed and that's a perfectly normal thing. So there's a lot of election literacy that needs to be done as well, but this feeds these narratives. And the more of these narratives that um, got loose, the more people started to watch the live streams and look for evidence of anything they thought was weird. And of course, when you're motivated to look for things and you don't understand the process, you're going to find what seems like evidence of election fraud everywhere. And that's really what happened a lot uh, in 2020. Um, here's a video that circulated claiming to be in Illinois. Um, and Chicago is a common target of this kind of mis and disinformation because of its legacy of political corruption. Um, and this was a claim that in 2016, these are Democrats stuffing the ballot box in Illinois. Um, and it got a lot of engagement. You can see this, this particular instance got over a million views. Um, this was shared you know, following the 2016 election. Um, and this is actually a, a, a polling place in Russia. So this is real ballot stuffing. It's just, it's just not in the US. Um, and uh, rumors like these you know, still circulate broadly. So again, it feels like here's, here's again, another Russian polling place passed off as Pennsylvania in this next example. It feels like evidence to people particularly who, who um, have been told by people they trust that this is happening, right? So when they see something like this, it feels like evidence. Um, and again, our cognitive biases kick in and make us want to accept these things rather than challenge them and vet them and, and uh, uh, make sure they're, they're correct. Um, Sam Weinberg and some researchers at Stanford uh, use this particular example with students. Uh, and asked them, you know, if it was strong evidence of voter fraud. And 52% of that group uh, thought that this video was strong evidence of voter fraud. And, and only 0.1%, a tenth of a percent, could find the actual source video. They had the skills to find the source video. And that's with, um, I believe, Stanford freshmen. So, um, uh, that's alarming. I mean, people often think that that uh, young people today are digital natives and they know how to reverse image search and find original videos and search for things online. And Weinberg and his team have found that that's really not true. They're they're lacking in that skill set. Um, one more piece from 2020, um, a kind of after action report produced by by a, a partnership called the Election Integrity Partnership. This is a group of researchers who took a look at misinformation around the 2020 election. And they had some key takeaways that I think are relevant and relevant for the rest of, of my talk. Um, one is that, as I shared, the overwhelming majority of election, mission, election misinformation in 2020 was uh, domestic. Um, 
and they highlighted this really important process that that incidents congealed into into narratives right so individual instances of perceived irregularities on videos on live streams people with their phones at polling places congealed into a false narrative that there was a systematic attempt to to steal the election uh, which congealed into a conspiracy theory which eventually just became conventional wisdom among uh, a, a large group of Americans that they just accepted that there are so many videos emerging, so many photos, so many people making this claim that there has to be something to it. Um, and this happened both in a top-down and bottom-up fashion. By that, they meant, you know, there were influencers like Eric Trump and others with a large audience sort of pushing these ideas down, pushing these ideas out to their audience, but also people with small followings on the internet who were capturing these kinds of things with their phones and pushing them. And those were getting picked up by people with larger and larger followings and eventually picked up by, by hyper-partisan influencers uh, as well. And then they found that there, are, there were repeat spreaders. And we know this from other studies of mis- and disinformation. A relatively small percentage of folks are responsible for a large and outsized amount of misinformation and disinformation that spreads online. Um, and I would sort of offer this around this process um, that, that uh, I, I love this, this, uh, this sort of trend line that they highlighted in this report um, and would, would sort of connect it to rumors about um, supply chain issues, which we've seen around the pandemic um, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, so that's a reality, right? The supply chain has been disrupted. Um, but since that is the case, people have posted a, a number of videos to social media where they see an empty shelf or they see an empty cooler like this one, uh, and they post videos like this. Let's take a look. I never seen anything like this in my life. So these coolers are actually um, uh, emptied because there was a refrigerant link leak. And as it was being repaired, that was emptied and then they, they refilled them. So that food was all there. That wasn't a supply chain issue, but this person genuinely thought what they were seeing was an issue of supply chain and it became a political issue. Um, so I would say that, that uh, this isn't just limited to election mis and disinformation, but that um, all mis and disinformation, particularly political in nature, um, can start with, with uh, incidents, sometimes accurate facts like supply chain disruption, an incident that is a perceived example of that, um, which feeds a narrative, uh, which causes more perceived incidents. So someone might see this video of a Walmart on social media, and the next time they're at Target, if they see an empty shelf, they might say, oh my gosh, I'm seeing it too, pull out their phone and create a post or tell friends and family about it. Uh, and that spawns ever more perceived incidents, which eventually just congeal into conventional wisdom, uh, which exaggerates the problem or distorts the problem, and in some cases fabricates a problem that, that isn't there. Um, you can see this with, with high gas prices, right? Gas prices ha have been up, especially since their historic lows during the pandemic as demand resumed. And then even as that was happening, um, um, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine and that sent gas prices even higher. Um, but you're starting to see posts, you know, we've been seeing posts like this uh, for some time uh, and gas prices are high, but they're not this high. So again, there's a truth here that gas prices are on the rise. People post things like this. This is actually an out of context photo that somebody took at a gas station that was not yet open. And when they build a new gas station like this Circle K uh, that's not yet open, they put the gas prices way up high so nobody tries to pull in uh, when they first activate the sign. So this was all fenced off. But somebody cropped that part out uh, and it circulated or took a, took a shot from a different angle and that circulated as well. Um, so for this next part, and I'm going to pause for questions in the middle because um, I know I'm throwing a lot, a lot out there and, and that you're, I'm starting to see questions in the chat, which is great. And please go ahead and continue to, to ask them there. Um, I want to highlight sort of three uh, motivations um, behind mis- and disinformation um, and uh, uh, just take a look at some of the things that have been circulating recently. So I'm kind of move on from our election frame just into to what else is happening right now and circulating in, in mis and disinformation. 
And one trend is that people post myths and disinformation to, to, to quote unquote chase clout online, to drive up big followings, to get lots of likes and shares. Um, and they do this for lots of reasons because fake internet points feel good, uh, because they want to create a, a social media account that has a large following, which can be valuable. They can actually sell those accounts to other people, sell the logins, say, I built an account that has 50,000 followers. Uh, somebody buys it, renames that account to make it about something else and uses it for their purpose. Um, so sometimes it's monetary. Uh, other times it's just, it's just to become a kind of partisan influencer figure. Um, and sometimes people share things for positive reasons because they, they want to support a cause. For example, Ukraine, this is happening a lot uh, as you know, the world, for the most part, uh, stands in solidarity with the Ukrainian people and, and against uh, Russia. Um, and early on in the, in the invasion, uh, this circulated. This is a post from Reddit, uh, which is a social sharing site. And um, uh, this is a Time Magazine cover clearly comparing Putin to, to Hitler, but it's actually not a Time Magazine cover. It's just a piece of digital art that was created by a guy named Patrick Mulder. Um, very, very easy to take uh, to, to create fake Time Magazine covers. There are even websites where you can upload a photo and make it into a Time Magazine cover automatically. Um, and Twitter has labeled this, you know, manipulated media. So the way that social media platforms are grappling with this and disinformation obviously is an ongoing thing. And I think very much, uh, you know, a very important civic conversation uh, that we're about to have again uh, around Twitter and uh, Elon Musk um, and his policies. Um, it's, it's already sort of peaking again. So it's an important, it's an important conversation civically, I think that we all need to, to, to prepare ourselves to engage in. And eventually there was likely to be legislation around that as well. Um, here's another popular meme. Again, this was a feel good meme. People wanted to believe that Time Magazine cover is true. People wanted to believe that the Ukrainian Roads Department um, changed all the road signs to vulgarities for the Russians. This is actually, you know, a, a, a photoshopped image uh, that they put out as a joke but they didn't actually go and change the road signs, but that was very fun to believe. Uh, videos like this one, which turn the volume down, sorry about that, which purport to be Ukrainian soldiers saying goodbye to their girlfriends or wives. Very, very popular, right? This is on TikTok. It got 877,000 likes. Seems impossible, but it's huge. Um, and then it jumped from TikTok to Facebook and Twitter. So one, one big takeaway uh, and one in increasing trend is that no matter what social media platforms do, no matter how Facebook cracks down on things, no matter what labels they apply, that piece of misinformation gets reposted to TikTok, to Twitter, to uh, Snapchat, to Instagram. So fake graphics, doctored images just jump across platforms. It's, it's a very challenging uh, environment for, for people to, to uh, keep up with. Um, this is actually a footage from an old documentary um, that was produced uh, uh, in, in 2016, uh, soldiers saying goodbye, I think in, from footage in 2014 as they went off to fight uh, in, in Chechnya. Um, and it was recently posted to YouTube. Somebody just took the footage, saw an opportunity to get lots of engagement and posted it on social media. Here's another one, you know, an allegation that a former Miss Universe Ukraine um, turned in her high heels for combat boots to fight for her country. Again, really fun to believe in, especially for people who support Ukraine. Um, but she's this is false. She's an airsoft rifle enthusiast. That's an old picture of her holding an airsoft rifle. That's not a real rifle. Uh, it was just taken from her Instagram account and passed back off online. Again, really easy to do to get big likes and shares and to just amplify your account. Here's another recent one uh, that uh, this, you know, that a, a Ukrainian beauty, quote unquote, blew up 52 invading Russian tanks. Fun to believe in. She does have a lot of medals. She's actually a military doctor. That's not true. Um, and we saw this also with Ghost of Kiev rumors. This is a mythical uh, Ukrainian uh, pilot. There's no evidence he actually exists, uh, but his face uh, or the person that, that uh, Ukrainians sometimes say is the ghost of, uh, of, of Kiev uh, gets photoshopped onto all sorts of pilots' bodies and different photos. So the, a lot of these are doctored images uh, and that has also gone viral. Um, here's a, another out of context piece. This is from TikTok, let's take a look. So this is circulating um, to say that it was the, the recent uh, sinking of the Moskva battleship 
in the Black Sea. It's actually an old video of the Norwegian Navy destroying a decommissioned ship in 2013. So again, these tricks of context are very cheap and very easy to do. Uh, and here are a couple of celebrities wearing hyper-partisan shirts. Sylvester Stallone wearing one, uh, appearing to, to amplify feelings on the right. Um, ben Affleck wearing some that amplify feelings on the left. Uh, these are both doctored images, though they never wore those shirts. They've just taken a photo of these celebrities and put a shirt design on them. Uh, and the folks that are behind this actually often are people who are selling these hyperpartisan shirts. So what they're looking to do among liberals and progressives is to circulate a doctored image of Ben Affleck saying, gotta love Ben, uh, and have a link to buy the shirt uh, in the comments. And then people who say, oh, I love that shirt uh, on the left, they want to go buy it. People on the right see that and go, oh, I love Sylvester Stallone, uh, and I love that shirt, I want to go buy it. So it's it's not folks who are necessarily interested in the politics and may not even be people in the United States, um, just seeking to use our polarization uh, to drive clicks to a t-shirt website. Um, but again, these kinds of things can congeal into perceived incidents. So for example, people who think Hollywood is liberal and you know have the strong feelings about that might see Ben Affleck, it might activate that pre-existing attitude and deepen that and entrench that idea or people who have ideas about Celestia Stallone or um, you know, um, ideas on the right may, may strengthen their uh, views based on that as well. So a key takeaway here for people who are, who are you know, pushing things for clout, you know, even uh, uh, misinformation that's amplified with, with good intentions like the Ukrainian examples I showed, they can cause harm. The Russians were pointing at a lot of those fakes like the like the Miss Universe example to say that the Ukrainians are lying to you. They're lying to you about this beauty queen. They're going to lie to you about fatalities and things like that. So the Russians tried to use examples like that to dismiss credible information. Um, and to, to note that hope is a really common emotional target or trigger uh, that, that bad actors try to, try to provoke. So if you're hoping something's true or you're feeling like uh, something is, is uh, share worthy because it uh, affirm something you strongly believe, like uh, like Ukraine, a victory in Ukraine, or something like that. Um, just pause and and ask yourself if you know that's authentic or true, because you really don't want to amplify it if it's not. And then just to remember that some disinformation is is solely motivated by personal gain. Sometimes it is just to create an influential account or to get some clicks or to get some dollars. Um, but there is, of course, disinformation for political gain for for a political purpose. Uh, and here's another recent example. Again, Eric Trump, um, you know, amplifies a lot of things pretty, pretty recklessly. And here, here's one. It's just a graphic, right? So there's no link to an evidence here, to any evidence here that these are authentic or accurate uh, inflation rates. Um, and there has, of course, been again. There's a seed of truth. Inflation is is on the rise uh, for a number of reasons. One of which is the injection of a lot of cash into the economy. Uh, with the Build Back Better bill and other, other infrastructure plans that Biden has passed. Um, but this says, you know, again, the facts are clear, kind of case closed, and Trump's post says nothing more needs to be said, but that's actually not true. Uh, be, there is more to be said. The, the, the inflation rate isn't at 14%. It's more like 7%, and inflation is a little more complicated than that. It's, it's both um, measured annually by monthly average by averaging 12 months as a year. So the, the, the USA Today uh, fact checkers kind of broke this out both ways. Here's a look at the rate averaged for each year and, and the rate uh, for December of each year. And it's, you know, it's less than half of what is um, proposed here for Biden and um, Trump's are closer, but, but also off by a bit. Um, so it's not just not a great place to get information about inflation uh, in a meme. Um, so again, you know, people who feel like prices are up, inflation's out of control, they see that. It resonates with a pre existing idea. It does have a seed of truth um, and it congeals into a narrative which could spawn perceived incidents. Next time that person is at the store and they see a price they think is higher than it was last time they were there, they're going to perhaps remember this, uh, maybe post that to social media. And again, this is how things sort of reinforce or self reinforce. So another example of, of political disinformation shortly after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, this graphic started to go viral pointing out that, you know, yes, there's airstrikes in Ukraine, Russia is, is conducting airstrikes in Ukraine, but uh, Israel's conducting airstrikes in Damascus and Syria, the Saudis are carrying out airstrikes in Yemen and the US is carrying out airstrikes in Somalia 
in the last 48 hours. Um, and this was put out by, by an organization called Redfish. Um, so if we wanted to sort of figure out who's behind this, it's actually a fascinating story, but these are the kinds of skills that we try to teach students, but a quick search is still your best defense against uh, mis and disinformation. So what I wanted to know when I saw this, um, let's just say, is what is Redfish? So I did a quick Google search for Redfish and went to their website and I see first a, a big banner piece about the, the Cold War and the role of the CIA overthrowing the government in Guatemala in the 1950s. And then I see one about um, British racism. I see one about uh, Colombia and the FARC. Um, I see neo-Nazis in Germany and Spain's housing crisis. So just problems all over the West uh, and you know, nefarious actions by, by Western nations. Um, so I wanna know about Redfish. If I go to the about page um, of Redfish, they'll tell me, I guess, about themselves. And they just describe themselves as an award-winning content creator, um, producing you know, short and in-depth documentaries um, for people who are involved in grassroots struggle all over the world. But you know, asking Redfish who they are and what they're about maybe isn't the most reliable source. So I want some independent uh, understanding of who they are. So I'm gonna search Redfish Media and then go to the news tab in my Google results. And here's a vice piece that catches my eye because it calls it, it has Kremlin misinformation in the title and Redfish is in the, the preview text there. Um, and so let's click in and, and search down. And if I wanna just look for mentions of Redfish, I can just hit Control F or Control Find and, uh, and look for Redfish, or I can scroll down and just scan the piece. Um, but here, let's Control F. And here's a paragraph that I'm after. So maybe I don't have time to read this whole piece, but I can see that um, Redfish, which uses the tagline objective but not neutral, um, brands itself as a community organizing, a community-based organization, um, but uh, is actually a, a Russian state-controlled entity. So Russia is very good at creating these very small uh, state-controlled media sources that look like trendy new digital agencies, but are actually Russian controlled. So Redfish is one of many uh, Russian state media organizations promoting Russian state interests, Russian government interests. In this case, just, just highlighting uh, problems in Western governments and actions by Western governments, including the fact that they're carrying out airstrikes to sort of minimize what they've done in Ukraine. Um, most people recognize that RT or Russia Today is one of uh, these outlets as well, um, but there are others. TASS and Sputnik are very well known, roughly a little less so, but Soapbox, Redfish, In the Now have a presence on social media. They're kind of aimed at young people. Um, and a lot of folks have no idea uh, that this is Russian propaganda. So really, really important to watch out for. And you can see how this particular graphic circulated. It made its way to TikTok. Um, uh, and there were a lot of graphics like this circulating at the time. Here is, here is the one uh, produced by The Guardian with, with you know, accurate and, and good information that's not promoting Russian interests. Um, but here are two TikToks where uh, this has um, these uh, appeared. One is just a copy of the graphic with music underlaying it, and one uh, is much more TikToky. It's a young person dancing, which is what TikTok's all about. Um, but just the text from the graphic or from that infographic is laid over this video. So it's even harder now. There's no way to know where that came from. Um, it's just a claim, right? Uh, Russian airstrikes in Ukraine, Israeli airstrikes in Damascus. Uh, they just took the text from the graphic and copied it. So now I couldn't do that process where I, I would have no idea that came from a, an organization called Redfish. Um, uh, here's another uh, rumor that circulated. Marjorie Taylor Greene, obviously very controversial figure. Um, and there was a rumor that she refused to applaud for uh, Vladimir Zelensky when he uh, uh, spoke to Congress uh, via via video conference, and this tweet circulated and showed her sort of looking at her phone for a moment while everybody else was applauding, and that's all the evidence that folks needed. Just got lots of likes, lots of retweets, um, lots of condemnation uh, in the comments. But Daniel Dale at CNN went back and looked at the video and said that you know this idea that she refused to clap, and again that started to get repeated in other posts. So it started to take on that sort of conventional wisdom uh, and fed into people's 
pre pre existing ideas about Marjorie Taylor Greene. So people who already didn't like her latched onto that information, didn't scrutinize it. Um, and he actually counted four different times when she did clap, went back to the video on C-SPAN uh, and, and corrected that. Um, uh, so again, this sort of perceived ideas uh, and perceived evidence um, is very important. Um, signs are also very commonly doctored. So you know this resonated among people who felt that masking mandates were overstated. Uh, the idea that a restaurant would put this on their sign, you know, we, we're a barbecue joint, we serve pork, we don't serve sheep, so take off your stupid mask. They didn't actually put that on their on their sign, uh, and they didn't put even any of these on either. Uh, this is a very common um, graphic. Uh, it's because this particular restaurant sign uh, is part of a fake sign generator that you can just type a message in and it puts it on the sign. You copy the image and put it on social media. So it's very easy for people to produce things that they might produce as a joke, and it is taken seriously by some people or some things that have more malicious intent. Um, quotes are obviously often taken out of context. Uh, this particular quote uh, was um, by uh, a, a white nationalist uh, named, I think his name is Kevin Strom, um, but it was just repackaged as a quote from Voltaire in this meme. Uh, and uh, uh, Thomas Massey, a representative in Congress, uh, mistook that as a Voltaire quote and actually amplified it. Um, and uh, that, you know, it's kind of, that kind of false attribution is very common. Doctoring news reports like this one, there was a rumor that Justice Sotomayor tested positive for COVID. This was around the time that um, uh, she and, and uh, another justice uh, had a conflict about wearing masks in chambers. Um, and uh, this is just a doctored CNBC graphic. So again, screenshots of news reports are something to be wary of. If there's no link to click, uh, it could be doctored. There's a reason someone's sharing just the screenshot often rather than the link to the thing itself. Here's another example of, of a CNN graphic that has been doctored. CNN did not report that uh, Elon Musk could threaten free speech by allowing people to speak freely. This is a satirical piece uh, or a graphic from a satirical piece, but it just circulated as a screenshot. Uh, so this is a doctored image. They took this shot of Don Lemon uh, from uh, uh, April um, and, or no, sorry, from January, 2020. Um, and then added elements to it uh, to, to make that rumor. This is just the, the Internet Archives, TV News Archive, by the way. It's a great uh, resource. Um, but the responses here are clear that people took this seriously. Uh, you know, it reinforced attitudes about the mainstream media. Uh, it, you can see this deepening polarization as we speak. This particular rumor targeted at people on the right. Um, and it, it, you can see, you know, leftists are insane. Uh, I can't watch the news anymore. So turning people away from standards-based news sources or mainstream media sources. Um, here's a reference to the deep state, um, uh, which is a QAnon fragment. Um, so there are conspiracy theories baked in here too. Um, and, you know, I hope he takes over Facebook too and stops the fact checking. The irony is there were fact checks below this, but people didn't really notice. They just commented quickly and, and moved on uh, on Facebook. So again, I think this, this is at play, sort of deepening these, these perceptions of, of narratives. So a quick takeaway here, and then I'll pause for a couple of questions before I wrap up. Um, uh, disinformation narratives are really designed to kind of hack our epistemologies or our ways of knowing, trick us with things that look like evidence, but aren't uh, out of context photos um, taking sample ballots and burning them and creating a video that seems like somebody burning ballots, but it's not, um, or, you know, graphics that aren't what they seem. Um, so it's really vital we ask ourselves, you know, how do I know this? Do I know it's authentic? Um, and is my belief in this warranted by evidence? Is this actually evidence? Um, are some, some great questions. So let me pause here and I'll look in the chat. And, and if, if uh, Barb, if there are any that, that you've seen sort of come through in the chat that you think I should take on, um, Great. Uh, yep. I do have a couple that I've isolated and, and okay. maybe I can save you some okay. looking time. Um, um, there's been a question about uh, what resources or trainings are available that would be helpful for all of us to help combat mis and disinformation in our communities. Yep. Um, you know, specifically, there was a question about how do we as adults learn about reverse image tracking and, and detection? 
Okay. Yep. So um, I will share a, a link um, here in a minute uh, to a video about reverse image search, but you can start on our website um, and um, check out, you know, the updates section, subscribe to our newsletters, not just to, not just to promote NLP, but we do do trainings for the general public. Uh, and we do have videos and resources and infographics and I'll share some of that at the end I'll highlight some of that at the end. Um, so there are ways you can you can access trainings both recorded and join live sessions that we do for the general public about this kind of thing. Right. Well, another question is um, to quote Maria Reza without truth, you can't have trust. So how can we address misinformation during public meetings or the new political mailings that we're all getting to help ensure trust in the election process? Any, any suggestions, any advice for all of us? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to politely with civility, um, not in the interest of shaming anyone who has an inaccurate idea about how elections work, but insist on accuracy when it comes to that, right? It's the lifeblood of our democracy. So um, if there are misperceptions, and it also you know, potentially disenfranchises people. There were tons of rumors that uh, you know, the election was being stolen in, in certain districts and, and people stayed home uh, who thought they didn't have a fair shot and their vote wouldn't count. Uh, there were people circulating rumors that exaggerated the lines that said, you know, fabricating claims like I'm standing in line at this polling place and they said that, you know, that I'm not going to be able to vote tonight and people didn't didn't turn out because of that. So um, I think it's, you know, it's important to, to help our communities understand the kinds of rumors that are circulating about writing on ballots, about too long a lines, about being turned away, about um, election workers, you know, showing up with new ballots late at night, which, you know, people use closed caption footage to make that claim that they were baseless and to help them anticipate that so they know what they're seeing the first time they see it. So to do some pre-bunking, I think, is, is really effective and just to stay on top of those and stay engaged in the process. And, you know, as many of you are, are going to election trainings or, or becoming election judges, I think that's going to be really important. You know, is it um, an effort that we should actively pursue to encourage the media and social media to take on a stronger stand for the truth when disinformation is rampant as it is now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, standards-based news sources, you know, really, really do have a concern for the truth and really do stand up for the truth. And there are a number of them that have, have developed pretty robust fact-checking wings uh, Reuters fact check is an uh, excellent resource. USA Today fact check uh, is, is very strong. Uh, Daniel Dale at CNN does a lot of fact checking. Donnie O'Sullivan at CNN does a lot of that as well. Um, so there are dedicated you know, fact checking departments and mis and disinformation reporters at a lot of news organizations. And they're, they're, that, you know, it's following them is, is very worthwhile. Um, Brandy Z. Rosny at NBC has a new podcast out um, uh, let me make sure I get the name right, um, called um, uh, Tiffany Dover is Dead, uh, all about a nurse who was one of the first to get the vaccine uh, in Florida and who fainted because she has a condition where, uh, you know, she has an overstimulated basal vagal nerve and fainted by happenstance. And there was a rumor that, that, that she was killed by the vaccine and that conspiracy theory has remained. And so she's doing a great podcast series on how this rumor got loose um, uh, and is very, you know, is worth looking up. So I think following that kind of coverage and also following the work of high quality fact checkers like PolitiFact, leadstories.com uh, uh, is another one, Agence France Press, AFP fact check uh, is another. Um, and to, to sort of just watch the flow of misinformation because you can begin to, to recognize patterns um, and, and develop a kind of internal system of red flags where you know it when you see it, or you know, like, wait a second, that's a disinformation narrative, or I recognize that as a, as a QAnon reference. I'm gonna be really careful here. That kind of goes into the next question Melanie asked about, um, could you discuss the link between civil discourse and the critical thinking that is needed to unravel information? I mean, is it our fast paced society? Have we learned to take yeah. things for granted or is it based on emotion or? Yes, <laughs> it's all of those things, I think. So, you know, keep in mind that social media platforms are free because we're the, we're the product, right? So our attention 
is the product. That's an attention economy. And the, the platforms need to help you stay on platform. They, they want you to ex extend your time on platform. Like YouTube, we've all been there, I think. Uh, watching a YouTube video and the next one up looks pretty interesting too. And the next one up looks pretty interesting too. And the next one up looks pretty interesting too. That's because they're all serving you ads. Uh, and so they try to make that as frictionless as possible. And Facebook wants you to comment and engage and like and share because the more you do that, the more dopamine goes out over the platform to people who posted things and they want you to post and they want you to stay. And so that infrastructure has a lot to do with it. Uh, they don't make it easy to leave. Uh, they don't give you links to, to get off platform. They try to serve you everything in platform. Twitter does the same thing. Um, and I think that's part of it. I think part of it is uh, more and more people who are getting really savvy at exploiting our inbuilt vulnerabilities and cognitive biases. You know, we're all vulnerable to confirmation bias, to motivated reasoning. Um, we're all vulnerable to, to uh, other mental shortcuts with that cause us to mistake um, faulty evidence as actual evidence. Uh, we have, you know, recency bias, we have a my side bias, uh, anecdotal bias, things that happen to people close to us uh, must be common because I know it, I can see it, I can touch it, I can hear about it. So um, all of those things, I think, are, are part of critical thinking, right? How do we know what we know? Uh, uh, and what is our process? is is really the question here and and that has a huge amount to do with with the way we approach um online content so so getting the right mental disposition uh i think when you're on the internet especially on social media it's really important there is um a wide and multiple request for the resources so that we can we can all take part in dispelling myths and disinformation. So maybe I should just let you move on to yeah, your I'll get to those resource slides. <laughs> I'll get to those at the end, and anyone can always uh, email me afterward for for more resources if I don't um, get to them or if you feel like you missed something. Um, I do want to say that I get your that. I do get your SIFT newsletter, and it's fascinating reading. Um, every time I receive it, it's to see what's been going on in the news in the recent weeks and Thank how you. to approach it with friends and neighbors. So, um, Yeah, and Get Smart About News, the one that I featured at the beginning is the version of the SIFT for the public. So the SIFT is written for educators and it sometimes has ideas to use in the classroom and then Get Smart About News um, is for the public. Um, I do have to, I, ju I just would suggest that the ideas for teachers to talk about with students are great ideas for me to how to approach it with people who like to share that information with me. <laughs> yeah, yep. So It is, and we have an infographic to help you sort of how to speak up without starting a showdown, which I have a screenshot of later in the deck and a link to on our website. So I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, um, good. So for this last chapter, I wanna talk about conspiracy theories and conspiratorial claims, um, uh, which are very common. And we see this around Ukraine. There's a whole contingent of conspiracy theorists who believe that the war in Ukraine is all staged, is all being staged because we're all being manipulated by a uh, super elite you know, cabal of people uh, a lot of conspiracy theories have a lot of things in common. A lot of them have roots in old anti-Semitic tropes, actually. Um, and so the graphics like these circulated and, and continue to circulate. And there's been a spate of rumors that Ukraine is faking deaths, uh, uh, which is not only baseless, it's, it's, it's offensive. I mean, it minimizes, you know, what are, what are crimes against humanity happening, um, uh, you know, there as we speak. So uh, rumors like this one, which has a video of people, looks like you know body bags in a dumpster, but one of them is smoking a cigarette. Um, and this counts for, for some people who believe that, that this is all being staged as evidence, except this is footage from the set of a music video actually shot in Russia. This isn't Ukraine, but you wouldn't know that because there's no context to suggest that. Um, this also happened around this video. So uh, this video is actually a, a climate change protest in Austria, but look at how savvy you know, this person was. They took uh, a report uh, from an Austrian news organization and dubbed audio from an NBC news report about Ukraine. So it circulated uh, this way. 
Look, I, you know, we're going to use the at least, at least 59 people killed, at least 149 people wounded. Those numbers are going to go up. There's just no question about that. I mean, you have fierce the body fighting in, the background in a number of locations the around background. the country. You mentioned Chernobyl. Russian forces quickly overtaking that area. We understand they are still in control. The other thing that went, hap went down today um, that was of huge importance was Russian paratroopers went into an airfield 15 miles outside of Kiev, and for a short period of time this afternoon, they held... And so often, you know, this also, so again, this is a protest, a climate change protest that was in Vienna in Austria, uh, where people sort of laid out in tarps to look like body bags to emphasize how serious climate change is and the loss of life that will happen if we don't put it in check. Um, and the footage of that and of one of the protesters having their tarp blow off and move, uh, similar to the cigarette smoking, circulated as, as evidence that Ukraine is staging deaths. That's audio from an NBC report. Um, here. Uh, so um, it, it was just stitched together and, and circulated in various iterations of that same Look, rumor uh, circulated. Um, so uh, here's a piece uh, in an Austrian news publication about that protest and what it looked like uh, that you can see the video is cropped tighter um, there. Um, here's another one. Two people working on what a Appears to be a stunt dummy. This was on Telegram, uh, and it claims that the armed forces of Ukraine are preparing to stage fatalities uh, and shout it's Putin's fault um, and working on a stunt dummy. Again, this counts as evidence for some folks that this is happening in Ukraine, but this is people on the set of a Russian TV series prepping uh, a stunt dummy for a stunt. Again, this is a shoot. Uh, of another uh, production uh, elsewhere. This isn't in Ukraine. This is old footage from 2020 on a movie set. So that idea circulated broadly. And again, I would suggest that uh, uh, these sort of um, theories and ideas and narratives uh, spawn other perceived incidents and prime people to receive the next rumor. So when they see the first one, they see it again, they see it again, they see it again. It starts to take on this, this sense of sort of conventional wisdom. And there's actually a phenomenon uh, like that called the, the illusory truth effect, um, uh, that if you see something enough times, you begin to think that there's, there's something to it. Um, so here's an accurate post from ABC News. So this is how, how sort of dicey this conspiratorial content can get um, about you firefighters in Ukraine battling a fire. This is an accurate post. It's an accurate video. Uh, ABC obviously has standards in place to, to verify and ensure that the footage it's showing isn't from years ago. And if ABC News would, for whatever reason, this would make no sense, tried to pass off old footage, they would be caught uh, by people online, by their peers, by other news organizations. It would be it would be quite a scandal. So there, there would be no interest in ABC, you know, trying to pass off old footage, and their reputation as a news organization would would be seriously diminished. Uh, but uh, that's exactly the claim that conspiracy theorists made. So they took their own tactics and accused reliable sources of information about Ukraine of doing the same thing, saying, you took these from 2018, and that got a lot of traction. Oh, look, ABC has been caught, except that's not the same building. This, this, somebody, took, somebody found a building that looks similar that was timestamped 2018 and just circulated that and said, ABC is lying to you, but that's actually a baseless false accusation. Uh, the ABC report is accurate, but they're using that to impugn standards-based news coverage, um, which again promotes Russian interests. So then this reply got screenshotted and circulated separately on Facebook. So again, remember, uh, misinformation migrates across platforms. Um, and you know, conspiracy theorists do use mo movie footage, they do use video game footage, but then turning around and accusing ABC of doing this is a pretty nefarious, uh, confusing trick, right? And I've seen some of the comments in the chat, like I just wanna give up on all of it, or I just wanna give up on all media, which I, I hope that's not the impact here because I, I think that's what they want. That's what disinformation agents and trolls and you know Russian uh, disinformation efforts are aimed at creating so much confusion that people just give up on knowing the truth. And in that kind of environment, they can do what they want, right? They can violate war crimes because they'll say, you know, well, who knows? Some people say we did, some people say we didn't. It's hard to know the truth. Who can you trust? And they just keep operating that way. So they, they're trying to accomplish that. Um, and so I would, I would encourage us not to, not to do that. Um, but again, this, this same uh, uh, incidents into narratives, into conspiracy theories, to more perceived incidents is at play here. 
Um, and this has actually been a Russian tactic during the war is to use fake fact checks. So Russians have actually created fakes that seem to support Ukraine just so their guys can fact check it and say the Ukrainian government's lying about this. So they're, tr they're really trying to create confusion about who you can trust, what counts as a fact check. Um, it, it's enormously uh, uh, unethical and, and kind of new uh, in this conflict. Um, and, it, and it's tough. And it's one reason why you know, standards-based sources are, are so important. Um, you know, not all sources of information on the internet are equal by any means. Um, people are also doctoring us. Again, this is another CNN post that's been doctored. Uh, these are both fakes, but they were circulated to say that CNN uh, claimed twice, two different times that the same person was killed fabricating, you know, the death of a journalist. Not true. These are fabricated posts that are screenshotted and then used as, as quote unquote evidence for some kind of nefarious action. Um, but it gets a lot of traction. So these are the comments on this post, right? Journalists are the enemy of the people. Um, you know, fact check sites are all owned and operated uh, by mainstream media, so don't trust them. So again, even when misinformation is debunked, there's a, uh, 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 an attempt to discredit them. Um, and QAnon remains a big, a big uh, trend uh, in, in uh, uh, election-based and political news uh, as well. And there's, there's evidence that quite a few people um, do believe it. This meme, though, is not accurate. 65% of the country um, do, not, uh, do not believe that the election uh, was stolen. That's, that's false. Uh, so that, that, again, is being, is being exaggerated here. So quick takeaways here. Um, conspiracy theories get traction because they, they satisfy our psychological needs. They simplify complex realities and give us a sense of belonging. And then bad actors really try to exploit and weaponize our vulnerability uh, to that thinking. So overall recap, just remember, mis- and disinformation circulates for a variety of reasons, for a variety of motives. They really try to hack our epistemologies to use our values and beliefs as a hijack uh, to, to, to redirect our civic agency. Um, and uh, uh, they're often designed to generate distrust in standards-based sources, and our own biases get in the way, um, as I mentioned. Um, uh, we're all sort of better off pausing engaging uh, our, our kind of system to critical thinking and not moving so quickly uh, on, on social media. So I, I'll let you review these sort of tips and things to remember um, uh, at your leisure um, and you know offered you this list of things that, that you can do uh, as well, um, sort of tips to, to sort of break out of some of this stuff, uh, some of which I've already mentioned here in the talk. Um, and I'll let you review these sort of pieces as well differences between user-generated content and standards-based content online, uh, and really not, not asking you so much to trust the press as trust the process uh, of a standards-based news source. And that process should be something that um, is transparent. One infographic we have, here's the first resource for you, um, is an infographic called How to Know What to Trust. Uh, and so you know, we're a big fan of the idea that you shouldn't evaluate all pieces of information in the same way. You would evaluate a meme from someone you don't know on the internet much differently than you would evaluate a standards-based news report from a source that you do know. Um, so this is a sort of step-by-step -step list of questions. Uh, and again, that's hyperlinked in the deck. So if you click that, you should jump to the website where you can download it and share it. Um, a few other resources here. Uh, again, you can go to newslet.org slash for everyone. Um, and you can check out uh, tips and tools, quizzes. Uh, you can check out our e-learning platform called Checkology, which we have some assets for the general public there if you wanna sit and go through some, some training materials there. Um, we have a number of infographics. One called, Is It Legit? Five Steps for Vetting a News Source. So if you encounter a source uh, that looks like a standards-based news source, but you're not familiar with it and you're not sure what it is, these are good steps to take. Um, you can also shoot that QR code or click the link in the infographic and take a quiz that tests your knowledge of that as well. And that's something that can be shared easily with other chapter members. Um, here's an infographic just summarizing a lot of the points about mis- and disinformation that I've showed you today. And there are some links to resources from the News Literacy Project and from others in the bottom right corner. Um, here's an infographic about advanced search, you know, learning how to, to do effective searching. Um, is a key piece of not being duped, of taking a minute to check things out and doing so efficiently. The more efficiently we can do these things, the more likely we are to do them in the moment 
uh, and have time to, to sort of know when we're being duped. Um, and this uh, uh, infographic has hyperlinked searches to remind you how to limit your results to news or how to target specific information online so that you don't wander into, into something that uh, you can't use or something that's maybe amplifying misinformation. Um, and here's that one about talking to friends and family members uh, effectively. Um, if you do have someone in your life who posts a lot of uh, unreliable or misleading or false information on social media, this is a guide to engage them either in the comments or in person uh, that you can find. And again, click the image in your deck uh, and um, uh, um, you'll go to the website where you can download your own copy. You can print them. Yes, you can put them out at events. Uh, we would love that. Um, and if you want to subscribe to our newsletters, as Barb mentioned, you can use the QR code or click on this link or go to that URL and subscribe there. Uh, through the school year, we send these every week um, and uh, we have a sort of summer edition that goes out as well. Um, we have a mobile app that helps you practice certain dispositions like evaluating the strength of evidence or differentiating between news and opinion pieces. Um, and that's called Informable, and you can find information on that at informable.newslit.org, uh, or you can go to your app store and just search for Informable by the News Literacy Project and download that and, and give it a shot and let us know what you think. Um, we also have a podcast called Is That a Fact, um, which you can find in your favorite podcast uh, provider on Apple or Spotify or whatever, um, and, or you can go to newslit.org slash podcast um, some great conversations there as well. So that's my quick resource rundown. We have some other stuff on our website that you can find, um, but uh, happy to, to chat further if there's time and take other questions or um, whatever, whatever we have time to do. Barb, you can let me know. Oh, Peter, thank you so much. You know, I always tease you that I'm gonna be president of your fan club, and I think I found some members here this afternoon. <laughs> So it would be, be looking out for the t-shirts that we're going to get. So um, Cheryl, I'm going to rely on you because I think this is the time we're going to break into small groups and um, say goodbye to Peter and give him our utmost thanks for being with us this afternoon and giving us resources on how we can talk in our communities, talk at our family gatherings this summer, and advice for us to be more aware of when things hit our emotions, we should think twice. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter. I mean, we see a you know, few of the questions in the chat with the resources. People really uh, love these resources. And so everybody will share those uh, with you after this session. And again, also, thank you so much, Peter, for that wealth of information. Absolutely. And any other questions that we didn't get to because I had too much to say, uh, <laughs> Barb, feel free to email me those and I can get you written answers back if you have more. So. Um, um, thank you all for your time, but I'll, I'll get out of your way and let you hop into your groups and discuss. Wonderful. Thank all you, right. Peter. Mm -hmm. Have Bye. a good afternoon. And everybody else, we know that um, part of what uh, folks have been interested in is having an opportunity to sort of chew on some ideas together as a community. And so one of the things we're going to do is to break you into small groups. And we're going to ask you to, as you think about the this 2020 election season and starting to build trust you think about what you might be doing in your community or your local league might be doing maybe some of the efforts around the elections like voter education voter guides candidate forums um what do you think uh what ideas come to mind that you could incorporate so I'll put that question into the chat. We're going to break you into groups of about four or five each and um, let you have a conversation for about uh, 10 minutes or so. And then we'll bring you back together and, um, and, and share some of those ideas with the larger group. Okay. All right. Presentation, presentation with, with a partner. Um, we're both part of a group called Illinois Indivisible Social Justice Alliance um, about disinformation at school boards. Now, how do we get associated with Social Justice Alliance? Because we both attended school board meetings and were upset about the, the pushback about critical race theory. And so critical race theory falls into Social Justice Alliance. And when, as we started looking into it, we found so much other disinformation that um, 
so many national groups that are well-funded by organizations that are effectively trying to dismantle public education mm. by causing parents to be so upset over, over these things that aren't happening, to pull their kids out of, out of public schools, put them in private or charter mm. schools, and then ask for vouchers, which will break public education. Mm -hmm. So we're very concerned about that. Yeah. Um, the, the other discussion that we had was, because it's Illinois indivisible, the League of Women Voters doesn't like indivisible because indivisible is has been tagged as being partisan. Mm -hmm. But our presentations, uh, we don't talk about candidates. We just talk about ideas and, and what is happening. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, I mean, from, from that standpoint, um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a League member. Barb knows. I mean, I, 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 do, I do gun violence prevention for the Illinois League uh, statewide. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... I, I'm, I'm very aware of, of the differences and what where it's step, stepping across the line means, and, and we don't do it in these presentations. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. And I do know one idea that people have when there's an organization that sort of has information, but the league considers partisan, is maybe to do something with an organization that may be seen as counterbalancing and having a forum on information. Things like that's one possibility. So thank you for sharing that resource, Jim, uh, and your civic work. <laughs> um, is, there, is there someone else who would like to speak, maybe would take one other share verbally from from uh, one of the resources or ideas that you that came up in your group that you thought you'd like to uh, use to build trust in this election time. If you did, go ahead and raise your hand. On the bottom, there's a reactions thing and we can open your mic or you can open your mic. If not, I'm seeing, I see Justin. Justin, go ahead if you would. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, it, it didn't really come up uh, too much in the in the uh, conversation that we had, um, but it's kind of just the idea of forming um, inter-organizational emissary programs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I see a lot of kind of common ground um, between various causes, um, and it seems mm -hmm. like if you just found means of kind of bringing some of these resources, um, population groups, ideas, uh, you know, all these things together, um, it could have a much larger impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justin. Great. Bob, we have time for one quick more question. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, wonderful appreciation for how informative the talk was. Second, and I put it in the chat, two things came up uh, as resources for uh, deliberation uh, locally. One is the uh, Center for Public Deliberation at Colorado State University. And the other is the Center for Deliberative Democracy at Stanford University. And I'm sure that those are just representative examples that lots of other universities could be good resources for trust building um, presentations and projects. Great. Thank you, Bob. And I see Kathy's put the link to the Colorado State uh, program run by a wonderful man and group of uh, people uh, in the chat. So thank you all. I think with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Barb just to close out this session with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. I can't thank you enough and can't wait for you to communicate to us how you've used some of the resources presented to you today so that we can share it in our network newsletter, how this information is being used, which will help us all when we all tackle this problem to rebuild trust in our democracy. Um, I do want to let you know that NCID LWV is going to be having two caucuses at the National Convention on June 24th at 8.30 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time. Um, Matt Leininger is going to be talking with us about building civic capacity in a time of disinformation and disruption. And at a date and time not yet determined by LWVUS, 
Dr. Terry Wu will have another presentation, how we move from us to them to me to you. Um, and Cheryl and Martha, who does our newsletter, will be putting the links for registration to those, um, to those caucuses in our monthly newsletter. So we would love to, as again, we would love to hear from all of you how you're using this information and together we can work to rebuild trust in our democracy. So thank you. Good, good afternoon. Have a pleasant rest of your day and we'll see you at the next program. And thank you all. Watch for an email with links to all these good resources uh, coming your way afterwards. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.